Hello and welcome to Successful School Leadership through the ISLIC Standards. My name is Desiree Alexander and I'll be facilitating your journey of going through the ISLIC Standards and breaking them down to a practical level. How do these ISLIC Standards relate to what you are doing in your school as a leader or in your district as a leader? So let's go through Successful School Leadership through the ISLIC Standards. First of all, who is ISLIC? ISLIC is not a person, but ISLIC is the name of the standards. It's the Interstate School Leaders Licensure Consortium. So that's what ISLIC stands for. Who developed them were the Council of Chiefs State School Officers in collaboration with the National Policy Board on Educational Administration. They created the ISLIC standards. The whole purpose of them were to standardize what makes a good principal. Okay, we didn't have standards, or a good leader, I should say, not just principal. But we didn't have standards to say, hey, these are the things that create, that make, that enforce good leadership in education. So that's where these standards came into play. Now, the ISIC standards were created in 2008, but they have been updated in 2015. And they actually had a set before this. But... For this, for these purposes, we're going to go through 2008 because those are the standards that are on the SLLA exam, which is the exam for educational leadership certification. So we're going to stick with 2008, but you, you may want to click on this link so you can see the differences between 2008 and 2015. You can get this PowerPoint on my website, educatoralexander.com. You can go into presentations, leadership, and you can get this PowerPoint so you can go ahead and click on the link and see the differences between the two. So let's get started. Standard one says that an educational leader promotes the success of every student by facilitating the development, articulation, implementation, and stewardship of a vision of learning that is shared and supported by all stakeholders. So if you look at this, a lot of times when we think of vision, we think of creating something, putting it on the wall, maybe having our students say it a couple of times and we're done. But that's not everything that you need to do for a vision. First of all, the vision has to be a shared vision. It's not just a vision that the administrator would create and that's what everybody needs to follow. It's a shared vision that's supported by all stakeholders. And if you notice, they tell you that it's not just the development and articulation of it, but we have to implement. And it's the stewardship of the vision. So it's not just saying, oh, hey, we put it on the wall and everybody knows, you know, what to say. But how do we implement this vision? How do we make this vision part of our culture? How do we make this vision so integral to our school that when we make a decision, we say, hey, does this follow our vision? Okay, so that's, that's the level that we want to have our vision on our campus. If we simmer this down to one word, it's going to be vision. Of course, I've said it about five times already. Vision. So a major question would be, as a school leader, how do you develop and facilitate the actual implementation of a shared vision? So let's look at how you would do that. First, we want to look at some dispositions. And I will tell you that as we go through the ISLIC standards, some of the dispositions are very, very similar because all of these ISLIC standards work together. Okay, so this administrator that, that believes and that understands uh, ISIC Standard 1, believes that every student can learn, collaboration with all stakeholders, because remember it's about a shared vision and the vision is all about student academic growth, high expectations for all, hopefully your vision will include high expectations for all. Now, you do have to examine your assumptions and beliefs about the school, about yourself, about the community, about your students, about your teachers. What assumptions do you have as that committee who's creating the vision? Because those assumptions are going to play into what you put into the vision. So examine your assumptions and beliefs about what's happening at your school. And of course, your vision should show that you believe in continuous improvement, but using evidence, using data, 
Okay, we're going to talk about the kind of goals you need to put in your vision on the next slide. So these are some thoughts that that administrator needs to think of before they jump into creating the committee to create the vision. Okay, some things that we need to ensure. You need to ensure that the vision and goals establish high measurable expectations for all of your students and your staff. So what that means is you need to make sure that your goals are SMART goals. SMART goals are specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and timely. So you need to make sure that your goals can be measured. If you say in your vision that we want to create good citizens, yeah, that's, that's an awesome thing, but how do you measure that? How do you measure a good citizen? Your example of a good citizen may be completely different from my example of a good citizen. So that's not a measurable goal. That's not a SMART goal. You need to ensure the process of creating and sustaining the vision, mission, and goals is inclusive, and you're building common understandings and general commitment from all stakeholders. So what that's saying is you can't just print something out and say, this is our vision, everybody needs to follow it. Okay, in order for you to have that general commitment and common understanding, that means people need to be involved in creating it. The more that they're involved with creating it, the more you're going to have buy-in, the more they're going to believe in it because their ideas are part of building it. Okay, so you need to ensure that the process of creating and sustaining the vision is inclusive. Then you need to ensure that the achievement of all students by guiding the development and implementation of the shared vision. Why do we have this vision? Okay, is to ensure student achievement. That's the only reason we have jobs. That's the only reason we do what our do what we do. It's for student achievement. So we need to make sure when we are developing and implementing that shared vision that we're making sure that it's all about student achievement. Three real world examples, breaking it down even more to how, what is, what is something you can go do today to help with standard one? Verify that all of your goals are SMART goals in the vision. So look at that vision and, and see which one of these are specific, measurable, action oriented, uh, action oriented, So what are three real world actions that you can take? You can take these today and go do them to help your campus with standard one. The first thing is to verify that all of your goals are smart in your vision. So break down your vision and make sure that everything that you're saying that you want to accomplish is a smart goal. Next is to create a committee of stakeholders. So again, you are never doing anything by yourself as an administrator. You are always getting stakeholder input. So create that, stakeho that stakeholder committee to look at your vision and see what you may need to revise. And then create action steps for implementing your shared vision. Okay, that's a really, really crucial one. Don't do all this other stuff and go, yes, we have a vision, it's shared, it's smart, we're awesome. What are the action steps to get to this vision? Okay, if you think about a, a vision is where do you want to be in five years? What are the actual action steps that we're going to take to implement our shared vision? And those action steps can become part of your school improvement plan. They should be part of your school improvement plan. Okay, because again, everything that you're doing should be towards your vision. If it's not, why is that your vision? Moving on to standard two. Standard two says an educational leader promotes the success of every student by advocating, nurturing, and sustaining a school culture and instructional program conducive to student learning and staff professional growth. The culture of your school needs to be steadfast on student learning and growing your staff, both of them, not just one or the other. For you to have a true, positive, nurturing school culture, it's about growing everybody on that campus. So what is that one word? Of course, it's culture. Major question. As a school leader, what processes do you use to develop an effective teaching and learning environment? What processes, what programs do you have at that campus? 
okay, to develop that effective teaching and learning. We can say we want it all day long. We want it, we want it, we want it, we want this good school culture. What are we doing? What have you implemented on that campus to create this effective teaching and learning environment? Now let's look at some dispositions. The principal or administrator or leader who is who believes in standard two and creating that culture believes in these things. Learning is the fundamental purpose of that school. I, I wanna I wanna put it on a t-shirt. Learning is the fundamental purpose of that school. Learning for everybody is the fundamental purpose of that school. Diversity is an asset. The more diverse students and, and teachers and everybody that we have on that campus, it creates a, a more open learning environment. Because the more diverse we are, the more we learn from each other because we have different viewpoints. Okay, they believe that continuous professional growth and development is key for your staff. Your staff can't get complacent. Okay, they have to continuously professionally grow. And you are a big part of that as an educational leader because they need the time to do so. They believe in lifelong learning for both students and teachers and everybody on the campus. Of course, they believe in collaboration with the stakeholders, high expectations for all and student learning. So what are some things that you need to think about before you act on this? You need to ensure a strong professional culture supports teacher learning and share commitments. So you you have to make sure that your teachers understand that you want them to grow professionally and that you expect them to grow professionally. You also have to have those shared commitments of your vision because hopefully your school vision that your teachers growing goes towards your school vision. You have to believe in that the improvement, to improve achievement of all students by requiring that all educators know and use a rigorous curriculum. They need to know the curriculum up and down. They need to know how to lesson plan with the curriculum. They know how to read, they have to know how to read the curriculum. I get very sad when I go to schools that implement a new curriculum and they all of a sudden want teachers to just understand the new curriculum. Well, what training have you give them to understand how to read the curriculum? Understand how to lesson plan effectively from curriculum. Then we can talk about best practices. But we can't just skip to best practices and just say you're on your own to read this and understand it. That's not fair. So you, you understand that to improve student achievement, your educators have to know how to use the rigorous curriculum and how to effectively teach the rigorous, rigorous curriculum. And that's how you can get that individualized success for all. Improve achievement and close achievement gaps by ensuring that appropriate sound use of assessments, performance management, and accountability strategies are used to achieve the vision. Okay, this is when we get to that assessment piece. So we have to make sure that our assessments are in line with our curriculum and that they're appropriate and that they make sense of what you're doing. I've seen some lessons that were awesome, but then they got to the assessment. It's like, how is that assessing anything that they've learned? That's not assessing anything. So you have to make sure that those assessments are in line with what you're doing. That's the only way you get true data to know if your students have learned anything. Three real world actions. What can I do today? You can provide PD for your staff and allow your staff to grow. Provide a meeting time for your teachers with a clear purpose, not just for meeting because we need all of your names on a sign-in sheet to show that we've had meetings. What's the point in that? Give me a clear purpose of why I'm meeting. Maybe today we're meeting to go over student data. The next day, we're going over what students are doing in the classroom, bringing in student work. The next day, we're meeting just to go over to create a PLN, a professional learning network. We're meeting to go through strategies. Like, hey, what are you doing in your class? Hey, what are you doing? Teachers need that time too, okay? They need that time to actually collaborate with each other. Not on the topic you give them, but hey, go and just collaborate. Talk about what you're doing. Talk about things you've learned on Twitter. Talk about and bring it all together. Okay? And then 
you can create rigorous calming assessments. Those calming assessments are going to cut down on what each teacher is doing in the classroom. What do I mean by that? Well, Miss Smith may be coloring all day and her students have A's and B's, where Mr. Tom is actually teaching a rigorous curriculum. All rigorous means is that it's aligned to the state and national standards. When you're dealing with curriculum, that's what rigorous means. So if Mr. Tom is teaching a rigorous curriculum and all of his students are making C's and D's, those common assessments is what tells you who's doing what in the classroom. Now, you may argue what well, the common assessments are not fair because they're created by this person. Well, that's a whole different topic. If the common assessments are created the way they're supposed to be created, then the common assessments are strictly on the national, the um, state and national standards, which is what you should be teaching. So when Ms. Smith gives that same common assessment, her students are guaranteed to fail because she's not teaching a rigorous curriculum. Where Mr. Tom's students honestly may still make C's and D's because they're struggling with the curriculum, but you know that something is being taught. Moving on to standard three. Standard three says that an educational leader promotes the success of every student by ensuring management of the organization, operation, and resources for a safe, efficient, efficient, and effective learning environment. I think I'll put efficient and effective together. So, Standard three is what I like to call the silent standard. If we want to be educational leaders, if we're not already, most of us have dealt with something dealing with the vision, something dealing with culture, the PBIS committee, whatever. But a lot of us don't deal with standard three. Standard three is all about operations. How do you operate this school to be efficient and safe? Okay, that's looking at all your entry points and your exit points in your school to see well, how do you need to set them up? Do you need alarms? Do you need someone monitoring? Do you want them locked? Do you want them unlocked? That's looking at your bell schedules. Are they efficient? Are they effective for learning? Your lunch schedule is looking at who you are hiring. Are you hiring the right people for your culture? Okay, are you hiring the right people for your, for your students? So all these types of things, when you're looking at how does this whole campus operate, is it efficient to student learning? So your major question, as a school leader, what practices, processes, and procedures do you use to create an effective and efficient learning environment? So what are you doing to create this environment? So some dispositions. This administrator will believe in a safe and supportive learning environment. That's what it's all about. A lot of students may not learn if they don't feel safe. Okay, if they're constantly waiting on something to happen, how can I learn your content? Collaboration with all stakeholders, of course. Equitable distribution of resources. Now, one of the things we need to look at in education is to look at equality through equity. So we like to say, oh, we want to make everyone equal, but you have to think of equity first because not everyone needs everything that you're given. So I can't say, well, we're going to treat everyone equally and everybody's going to get this. Well, I may not need it. Okay. But that person may need double of whatever you're given. So we need to think about equity, equitable distribution of resources over equality. And I like to say equality through equity. Operating efficiently and effectively and the management in service of staff and student learning. So three things you need to think about before acting. Distribute leadership responsibilities and supervise daily ongoing management of structures and practices. Build up your people, okay? Build up your staff. Build up your students. Start distributing leadership responsibilities. Teach them how to lead. So start doing that. Start building them up. Start showing them how to do different things with operations. Okay, start building them up. And then, of course, you need to supervise daily and supervise the ongoing management. You shouldn't be that administrator that doesn't know what's happening on your campus, in your office, or in your district. Establish an infrastructure for finance and personnel that operates in support of teaching and learning. Are you hiring the right people? Are you using your funding in the correct way 
for your campus. Ensure a safe environment by addressing real and potential challenges to the physical and emotional safety and security of students and staff that interfere with learning and teaching. Okay, think about all the safety stuff that happens on a campus. We're not just talking about physical safety, but bullying, emotional safety. Okay, so think about all of this stuff. What is happening and how can we address this? That's where a strong committee comes into play. Have some students on your committee. Okay, but when you have that committee, it has to be a place of honesty. Because if you have that committee, but nobody feels like they can speak out or speak up or you're going to get upset, then what's the point of having a committee? So you need to have that committee that will say, you know what, you adults don't know about what's happening in this area. Or the teachers may even tell you, hey, you don't know what's happening in these areas. So you need that type of that type of environment well, where you can address all these real and potential challenges before they happen. So three real world actions that you can go and do today. Start distributing leadership assignments. Develop and implement an observation plan. When are you observing? Who else is observing? When are you walking around? And when I say you, I mean you and your committee. When are you guys walking around looking at things, looking at how things run, noticing what's happening when the bell rings, those kind of things. So develop and implement that observation plan. And develop and implement plans to handle building and personnel issues. What is, what is if a teacher's having a problem with another teacher, how is that done? How is that reported? If you're having any kind of personnel or any kind of issues, just how are they reported? How do they get to you? Who handles them? All of that needs to be developed and implemented in whatever plans, safety plans, and whatever plans that you need to have developed on your campus. So this is some three real world things that you can go ahead and get started with now. Standard four, an educational leader promotes the success of every student by collaborating with faculty and community members responding to diverse community interests and needs and mobilizing community resources. How do you get your stakeholders involved? How do you get your stakeholders active? What is a stakeholder? A stakeholder is anybody who's involved with your students being productive citizens in the community. So of course, that's your students themselves, that is um, your teachers, that's your custodial staff, that's your cafeteria workers, that's your uh, office managers, your counselors, your principals, that's everybody on the campus, okay? Then you branch out. That's your other schools in the district. That's your board members. That's your superintendent. Then you branch out. That's your community members. Those are your community businesses because I have a stake. If I run a business in your area of your school, I have a stake in you producing good citizens, even though, you know, that's not a smart goal, but good citizens, I don't want them breaking into, into my store. I want them to actually make money so they can spend money in my store. If I'm an 80-year-old in the community, I mean, I have a child at your campus, but I still have a stake in you producing citizens that will, will not break into my house and that will give me the right medicine when I go to the local pharmacy and things like that. So all of these stakeholders how do you include them okay how do you how do you get them involved so breaking it down it will break down into stakeholders your major question as a school leader how do you build relationships with your students staff parents community business leaders and your surrounding community how do you build those relationships hmm so some of the dispositions you believe in high standards for all, including family and community as partners. You're not just you're not just involved in them in involving them because you feel like you have to, or involving them because oh they said it's a best practice. No, I want you to be a partner with us. Okay, I want us to be able to call on each other for the success of our students. You is you have a respect for the diversity of the family composition. All families are not built the same way and I have a respect for that I understand that families are going to look different and continuous learning and improvement for all so 
Before acting, these are the things you need to think of. Extend the educational relationships to family and community members to add program services and staff outreach and provide what every student needs to succeed in life and school. Extend those educational relationships. Bring in those families and community members. How can they help you with the, with the achievement of your students? How can they help? Okay, that's something that your committee definitely needs to think about because you have, most of us, have a lot of resources that we do not use because we don't think about them as resources. Respond and contribute to community interests and needs in providing the best possible education for their children. Okay, so I'm going to see, hey, what is the community interested in? What is the community need? And I'm going to build that relationship where we can work together. It's not about what can you do for me? What can you do for me? What, what can you do for me? But hey, what can we do for you? Let's work together. Maximize shared resources among schools, districts, and, com and communities that provide key social structures and gathering places. So you know what? What resources do you have? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what I have. Show me what you have. And let's see how we can work together. Okay, because you may have a resource I need. I may have a resource you need. So let's see how we can work together to do this. So three real world things that you can do right now. Communicate with the community about their needs to build relationships. Okay, this is what we need. This is what you need. Let's build this relationship. Create a calendar of community events to participate in. Some of your community are having events and they would love for you to promote them. They would love for you to tell your students and parents and teachers, hey, look what's happening in the community. So let's start, let's start promoting them. Let's start building that relationship by also giving to our community. And create a list of resources available to your stakeholders. Hey, these are the things that we have. And when it says create a list of resources, it's not just talking about creating the list Create resources. So if you say, you know what? We really don't have any resources for our parents. Okay, well, we need to create some. We need to create a PTO. We need to create a parent library where they can come and get resources. Maybe we need to create some, some classes for our community. Hey, you want to come learn computer skills? We're going to have a class after school. Not just for parents, but for our community as well. So what are your list of resources available to your stakeholders? Moving on, standard five. Standard five says an educational leader promotes the success of every student by acting with integrity, fairness, and in an ethical manner. So to boil this all down, standard five is all about ethics. And I will tell you that in order for you to teach someone to be ethical, you're going to model how to be ethical. Major question. As a school leader, what processes do you use to encourage individuals in the organization to act in an ethical manner and practice the principles of their process? What are you doing to encourage this? This principle believes the common good over personal interest. Okay, in order for you to act, act ethically and with integrity, you have to understand that it's not about you. You need to give up your ego. Okay, it's not about personal interest. It's not about this school making me look good. I need, I need, you know, to succeed because my name is on it. No, it's about the common good, not just all about your personal interest. Taking responsibility for actions. Okay, take responsibility for what's happening on this campus. We can't keep saying, well, you know what, I tried. Oh, I mean, I, I, they just want it. Well, what if the teacher said that about the students? You'll be the first one to say, well, no, 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 we can't, we can't give up on our students. We can't say that. Okay? And so take responsibility for your actions. Take responsibility for the actions that are happening on your campus. Ethical principles in all relationships and decisions. Modeling high expectations. And continuously improving knowledge and skills. So before acting, this administrator needs to think of demonstrate appropriate ethical and legal behavior expected by the profession. 
you have to model what you want to see. And you can say things like, well, I've already gotten mine, or I'm the adult, and all this stuff that we say sometimes. But we need to model what we want to see, point blank, period. This administrator needs to demonstrate their commitment to examine personal assumptions, values, beliefs, and practices in service of a shared vision and goals for student learning. What do you believe in that may be hindering your campus from achieving the vision? What do you believe in? What are your values? What are your beliefs? What are your prejudices, okay, that are hindering your campus moving forward? And you may, I love when people tell me, you know, I don't have any prejudices. Well, everyone has prejudices. Not everybody is racist, which is a completely, or sexist, okay, or ageist, or you know, all the other is. But we all have prejudices. We all feel certain ways about people based on appearances, based on actions that they take, and we make those snap judgments. We all have prejudices. So it's when we sit and we examine those prejudices and those assumptions that we make about people and our own values and beliefs that we can say, okay, well, what am I actually doing? What are the practices that I'm doing in service of my vision that actually may be hindering us from getting to our vision or achieving our vision? And this administration, this administrator performs the work required for high levels of personal and organizational performance, including acquiring new capacities needed to fulfill responsibilities, particularly for high stakes accountability. Are you continuously learning? You're part of that campus. You need to be continuously learning yourself to make sure that you are keeping those high levels of expectations for yourself and for everyone else. Three things you can do today. Create PD opportunities to review and eliminate negative assumptions. So not just yourself, but get some PD about cultures. Get some PD about building relationships with students. So we can look at our negative assumptions about poverty, about high income, students and parents or whatever because we all have those assumptions kind of bringing the ugliness that we may have to the forefront so we can eliminate it create ways to self-evaluate on a continuous basis showing your your teachers and yourself hey this is how you self evaluate record yourself and notice how you relate to students notice what you're doing in the classroom do some self journaling do some surveying Hey, how are you feeling about this class right now? So learning how to self-evaluate and get that feedback so you can be better. And create a plan for your own PD. You also need to continuously learn. And last but not least, standard six. Standard six as an educational leader promotes the success of every student by understanding, responding to, and influencing the political, social, economic, legal, and cultural context. This is pretty much saying, how do you affect education on a more global scale? So what do you do outside of your school, outside of your district, wherever you're an administrator, what do you do beyond that to help your the educational landscape? Global is balling it down. How are you helping the global educational community? So the major question with this one is, as a school leader, how do you begin and maintain an open dialogue with all stakeholders, affording yourself an opportunity to benefit from a variety of ideas, values, and cultures? How are you opening yourself up to learn more, to effect more? You have, If you're going to talk about affecting education on a global scale, you can't just stay in your little box. So this administrator believes and advocates for children and education. You're going to fight. You're going to fight for students. You're going to fight for education. You want to influence policies instead of just sitting there saying, I can't believe they came up with that. Well, what did you do? Okay, what did you do to try to influence that policy? Are you on any legislature committees? Like, what are you doing? Who are you meeting? Who are you networking with? What are you doing? To uphold and improve laws and regulations, that's that support. So you're an advocate and you also have to be supportive. 
Eliminate barriers to achievement. What it what is stopping your student achievement? Hmm. Build on diverse social and cultural assets. Okay, how are you networking? How are you taking the social and cultural assets at your school and using them? Or in or in your district or in your state or however you're working on a global scale. So before acting. This administrator needs to think about improving the broader political, social, economic, legal, and cultural context of education for all students and families through active participation. Active. Not just joining the committee, having your name on it, and then when somebody asks, you can say, well, I'm on that committee. Are you active on that committee? Okay. And exerting professional influence in the local community and larger educational policy environment. You're not going to have a professional influence if you don't get involved. Contribute to policies and political support for excellence and equity in education. What are you doing? What are you doing to affect these policies? And work with policymakers to inform and improve education policy making and the effective effectiveness of the public's efforts to improve education. Again, how are you involved? How are you networking? Who do you know? How are you meeting other people that have this power to, to affect policy change? Okay, you have to get out there. Three things you can do today. Join and actively participate in education committees. Advocate for your school. Fight for your school. If not you, who? Create or, or your district. Create action steps for getting more involved in policy making. So don't just join and actively participate, but then create those action steps. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. If you have a committee, this is what we're going to do to get more involved in policy making. So these are some resources that you can look at. Some of this information came from these resources. So I put the links. So you can actually click on them and see these resources when you get this PowerPoint. Again, the PowerPoint is in resources. It's also on my website, educatoralexander.com. You can go there and you can get this PowerPoint. So hopefully this has helped you break down the ISIC standards and you can understand them a little bit more and a little bit more practically of how does this look in an actual administrator. Good luck in all of your future endeavors.